This is tape number two. The survivor's name is Lanka Ilko. Mrs. Ilko, could you speak uh, a little bit about your, the relationship that you have with your grandfather? My grandfather was my life. You know, if they hit me at home, he would he would fight my father. If he, my father would hit me for no reason, you know, we was peeling corn, you know, and. I was a child. I wanted to go out to play. And I was sitting there and peeling. He went out. My father took me by the hand and slapped me back and hit me. I should do that. It was Friday and he wanted should, this should be done. So he hit me. My fa uh, grandfather went to my father and he took him by the neck. And he says, don't you put your hand on her. Why don't you sit down and do it? Why you want the child to sit there all day long and peel this corn? And my grandfather was helping too, but it was impossible to do all in one day. But so they make the, like parties, Saturday night or Sunday, and all youngsters came in, had a party, and they peeled the corn. That's why they do it. They didn't do it by machine like they do it here. They did by hand everything. And my grandfather, he always was on my side. Always telling me stories from the war he lived through. And how the Cossacks came and the horses. And uh, he used to sing songs, r Russian songs for us. And, uh, like when my brother was born, he was singing Kolisa Cesario the Huris Nimali, the Cossacks. When they went up and they shot them and, and, and they didn't live to see it, but they wanted to see. So he was singing this in Russia for us all the time. And did, he, did he give you hope throughout the, your years in the camps? Well, he just wanted I should go to America, and he didn't want I should stay in Europe. He said, you go to Frumet, a Jewish name, his daughter was Frumet. So he wanted that I should go to her because she's religious, and I should go to her and stay with her. But she had uh, two sons and a daughter, and I wanted to go. I had the papers and everything, but my parents didn't want I should go. They wanted me to suffer. At least I would have saved my life. And it was very hard to go away already, but they were thinking a girl to go in, uh, to Prague, and so they didn't want to. So just wanted me to get married, which I did. You, you were talking earlier about when you went to Unguar. Um, who was there with you? Uh, this already after my husband went away, you know. What so, was his name, your first husband? Uh, Morris Lebovich. When he went away, I didn't want to stay in, you know, by myself. So I always went to the city, to Ungwer. But they had a movie house. So I went to the movies. So my mother found out you know, she was very angry because I had a, a wig. And when I come to Ungwer, I threw away the wig, and my aunt told me like this, your husband went away, and you don't know when he will be back or he will be ever back. Why should you cover your head? So I grew back the hair, and uh, naturally, my parents didn't like it. So uh, my mother came once and she told me I should come home and stay with her because my laughters are crying for me Friday night. So I didn't want to come home. So I stayed with my aunt, with that aunt. She was a cousin, but I called her aunt for, uh, in Ungwer. So one day, my mother wanted I should come home for Shabbos. And she says, cover your head when you're coming through, this, through the town. 
And I say, Mother, they will wander just once, and I'm not doing what I'm not doing anymore. So naturally, the town Jewish people was very religious, so they say I was a bad person. I did that. But my aunt was right. Why should I wear a shirtle and, uh, and cover all with my head when I have no husband? So I agreed with her. So one Shabbos I came home and we went always to visit. Uh, from the beginning of the town was a Karlstein family and we went there for Shabbos visiting. My mother says, put on a nice uh, Babushka. I said, no, mother, they will look at me once and, and then they will get used to it. That that's what I'm doing. So I did that. They really talked about me, but I didn't care because if then my mother realized really herself that I'm so young and, and uh, <coughs> to tie down my head all the time. So once I was in Ungbar, before I went home, already they knew when I got home. So I went shopping vegetables um, they had uh, this, uh, on the street. And uh, I saw a man from our town. When I saw, I grabbed my babushka and put on my head. And he, he saw it, and he went home and said, I saw Leah, and that's what she was doing. She so was talking about me. But uh, my mother quiet down later, realized that a stupid guy, man, I should do it. So, so um, who was it who actually came to your house and, and rounded up your family? Well, the uh, first... I, we had to, in 44, we had to wear the yellow star. And uh, so I was home because after my brother died, I came home. And we had to wear this. And once I was going the other end of the town, and they come out of the church, and a young boy, I used to be very friendly with his sister because she was living in Prague and she came home and she was more educated, I could talk to her. So I went to, to visit her and he came and was a bridge and he was peeing on me. So I went and I pushed him and he fell down from the bridge. So his mother came and she called me all the names of Earth, you know, Torah uh, Shit This means uh, the, shit, the Jewish people have uh, something on. My husband has no. Is uh, so, but he came, her husband, and I told him what happened. So he agreed with me. He said, "Why did you do it? Who told you to do that?" So then I didn't go already to visit his sister. I came home. And the police came the next day. The, she called the police, but they didn't do nothing because I could talk to Hungarian already, and I talked to the police. And I say, what should you do? I was protecting myself, and he fell off of the bridge. I pushed him, really. So this is what happened. And then in the spring after Pesach, they come in, the police, the Hungarian police came and took us. And from the town, the, oh, the guy who was the head of, from the town, he came with them. And I took money, I had a lot of money. I bought dollars and uh, I was black marketing during the war, so I had money, and I took out that I will take with me the money, and I left it on the table, you know. <laughs> Never took it, left it there. And I was so aggravated, I didn't take the money, but it wasn't worth nothing, the money. 
So where did they take you to? They took us to Ungwer to that uh, uh, brick factory. How long were you there for? Well, they took us in April and in June they took us to Auschwitz already. So, so what was it like in Ungwer? Well, people was very hungry. They, we, I wasn't because I was uh, helping in the kitchen. I was always a cook, so helping in the kitchen. So, but so I helped my family and a few from my, from my uh, uncles and so like my father's brother. He was had a long beard and pears and he was so from. So he was a uh, shamus in a shul. He t uh, taught children. I have here a f friend. He says, yeah, your uncle hit me so all the time. The, the cell and data key of Wolfgang gets in the feta key. You understand? They were teaching that the cell skinny cows ate up the fat cows. So I was, uh, you know, just learning a lot in, from what they t taught the boys. So when my uncle, I used to go there, I listened to him. I learned a lot from him. And he was very nice to me, that uncle. Was there a lot of starvation in Ungwar? Yeah, there was, yeah. But I went, they asked people to go out for work. And I volunteered, and they took us to sort cl clothing. You know, they put all the clothing that they took from the Jews. So in a, they put in a big warehouse, and we was selecting the sizes and so on. And uh, <coughs> then when they took us back, there was a, a, like a delicatessen. And I went in and I bought herring and things to bring back. And when we come in the inn, they were taken away from us. So I was staying behind and I threw over the fence. And when they let me in, I went and I took it. You know, so I was giving for all these people who didn't eat. Like I felt sorry for the for the dying and for the rabbi and for all these people. So I was giving away. Once I got a case of whiskey and I was going, giving everybody. Here is Dr. Steiger. I don't know if you heard from him. His brother is dying now in Israel. He married Diane's daughter. Yeah. She's nobody. He come. Fr they have come from a very nice family. His uh, father was a b bank director, and they was going to Ungwer to school and down to Munkach. They spoke always Hebrew or uh, English, and so uh, his parents was there, and his mother I liked very much. So I went and I gave him a bottle of whiskey. They said, they will never forget. And I'm with Svi very close. They say, you my brother. We are very close. But um, the, this was, you know, who went out, you could get food. And if there was young girls, they were sitting, they should come peel potatoes, do something. I used to put, to make dough, you're not allowed to take out. So I put in my brassiers, and I come and I give those who had lots of children, so I give those people. Maybe God helped me for that, to survive. Because I did a lot of good deeds. So I, I was crazy, I always give away everything I had. And then what happened after Ungoar? Well, then they were staking, like those rich people first and they put them in a separate barrack. And they were taking them to Auschwitz, but with the families, they were taking them. So they were taking my uh, cousin, which I was so close, 
And I went there and asked them if they should take us to wherever they go. <clears throat> so they took, took us together. And as we, for days we was going on that train, no end to it, and no food, just what we had, some. And how many times I, I go to eat, I remember, and my little brother was saying, why do you be hungry? I'm hungry. So I said, no, we have to save. We don't know how long we'll be here on that train. And we saved, and we come finally to Auschwitz. Before, before you discuss Auschwitz, what, what did people do about uh, have, if they had to go to the bathroom? Oh, this was horrible. They took pots and pans, and you went, they make something to cover up, and they went in the bathroom. And uh, one boy, he made a hole in the... In the cattle in, car? In, in the cattle car, yeah. So he had a knife, and he made... He was drilling so much that he went out himself, ran away. This is that, and he lives in Tel Aviv. You kept in contact with him? Yeah, yeah. And Did anyone else try to escape through that hall? No, because the train was going so fast that he risked his life and he went out. Nobody knew. Look, we didn't have to. God was not on our side because that winter in the spring in Europe, you plow the, f the fields and you work in April, and that April was so much snow, we couldn't get out of the houses. So, like no, in April, when I come home from Palm Spring, the 20th is my birthday, and I couldn't believe it, so much snow we got. So that's why people didn't run away, because I was thinking we stick together. Wherever my parents go, I go with them. They said, we're going to work, so I'm young, I will work. You know, then uh, we was blind when uh, somebody uh, asked us to run away before. That teacher come and talk to me. He says, Leah, uh, you and your sister can I take you away and because you can live like Christians. Then you're both blind. I always was. I had a reddish blonde hair and my sister almost white hair. And he says, I take you to my parents and then they they will send you someplace. And you can live any place, nobody will bother you. Boys couldn't hide, but girls could. I I was so brought up to respect my parents. So how can I go away and leave my parents? Whatever happens to them, happens to me. Which was wrong. Those people who ran away, they was, look, that guy ran away, he went to Romania and he suffered, and then for some reason he come to Palestine. So long he come to Palestine. So it's Tzvi Steiger, he too went to Romania, and uh, down to, to Israel too. Could you talk about what your experience was when the cattle cars stopped arriving in Auschwitz? Well, this was a disaster. The uh, Jewish boy comes up and he says, he didn't want to talk. He was scared. He, he said, where are we? He says, in Auschwitz. Never heard of Auschwitz. So he says, leave everything and we put nicely together and we will come back. And then again, I feel sorry I didn't give my brother he should eat at least. So how many times I make a bite in breath and I think, oh, I, I called him Shamku. Shamku was hungry and I didn't give him to eat. So anyway, we put everything together and go out and he says, if give the children for the old people and you go to the right. Don't go to the left. But he didn't say why don't go to the left. But my brother and my father went to the left right away. They killed them the same day. Because when we come 
to Auschwitz and they selected us to the right. And they took us to the bed and again I put together my, my sweater, my brother bought me that sweater so I put it nicely together that I will get it back. But I shaved our heads and I never in my life saw my mother naked and everybody was ashamed to be naked. So they give us one dress, took us to the bed and they give us one dress, you couldn't just put on on the wet body, and took us out and marched us all the way to the sea lager. The sea was the Vernichtungslager. They took to, for that every day. I don't know how many thousands of people was there, but every day was selections. You passed, if you have a pimple, any place you go on. But maybe because I lived on a farm and we had butter and we had milk and we had everything, I never had pimples, my sister either. How many people would they make for these selections? Would they take out? I don't know, all the time, a whole bunch of people they took away, hundreds of people. And they did every week selections. So, but for some reason, where I was in that uh, lager, and that was, uh, was a long, long, I think 3,000 people was there. So, uh, uh, they, the Blokova, who was in charge of the... What's that? Uh, she was in charge of the whole block. She was from Mihalovce, she was a Slovak girl. But she was married. Her husband was a doctor. And she was so mean. She says, I'm here five years, and you just came. You ate chung when I was hungry. So she was very mean. She was Jewish? Jewish, yeah. After the war, we wanted to kill her. But she, the SS woman, protected her. I don't know. She was always, she had a room for herself. And that SS woman was always going to her. So what kind of things would she do? How was she so mean? Well, she wanted we should go to sleep, you know. But we was there in, when they brought us to the sea lager in was one, two, three, you know, those uh, when they put Bunk. everybody bunks, Bunk. the bunks next to each other tight. So we was in the middle, and uh, well, if one turned, all had to turn. We was uh, 14 there, 15 on top. So uh, she used to go with them, hit people for no reason. She, she was. Then she asked me if I, if I want to take care of my bank to give food. So I did it. But all people from uh, the city where my father was born and my uncle lived, they was running to me, liar, give me a little, give me a little. So I said, here a little, here a little. I didn't have enough for myself. For, uh, so I went to her and she hit me horrible and she says, next time you won't get it. Now I give you more, but you won't get it. You can't do that. They should wait till they get it. I thought I'd die. I couldn't stand people crying, elderly people. So What did she hit you with? She had a stick, you know. Uh, in, uh, I give up my position. I say, I don't want it. Because I never got to eat for myself and for my mother. I should give them first. But my mother was six months with us together. And after the, after the six months, they took her away. It was big selections. And uh, they took her then away together. But we was, uh, they took us in Auschwitz there, we was chopping stones. You know, I lived on a farm, so I knew a lot of things how to do. 
but this was flying in our faces, these stones. So when the selections came, we hid in the was a long room with toilets, you know. So we were sitting on the toilets, and in the morning when the transfer was taken, we jumped in with my mother. So we was in the transport. When we come, they give us a bed and they give us clean clothing. And uh, they didn't give us underwear. We was freezing to death, just a dress. And we was, uh, and my mother was crying. They took her away and she begged the, there was a Polish woman, a Jewish woman. And she asked her, Gnädige Frau, lassen Sie mich zu meinen Kinder. You know, let me go with my uh, children. And she took her away, and then the next day, we were staying there in a barrack. And the next day, I saw my mother going to the gas cameras. I already knew where it is and how it looks. So this was the hardest thing on me to see my mother go, you know. She would have survived because she was a hard-working woman. She would have survived. But <laughs> this was hard to see. When I was, they took us down away from Auschwitz and I was crying, and my sister says, why are you crying? I say, what's the matter with you? We're leaving here, everybody, and we don't know where we're going. And everybody's here. Life or in death, but they are here. And we had a, a cousin, which <coughs> which she uh, was my uh, father's brother's step child, no step granddaughter. So she was with us, and she was screaming, Mommy, and she, they had lots of children, and she named it all the boys, and she was the only girl. So I think they were seven children, and she was screaming horribly. My sister, she, she just took everything for granted. I know she was hurt, kind of didn't care what they do, just, and they brought us to Breslau there, to the camp. Who's this the young girl? 